Welcome everyone uh, to another session of the um, Development Studies uh, Seminar Series. Um, my name is Faisia Smile. Um, today uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Ben Selwyn, who's going to be talking about um, the struggle for development. Um, this is the title um, also of his uh, the new book that he's working on. Um, ben did his PhD at SOAS um, and he now teaches in international relations at the University of Sussex and he's also the director of the Centre for um, Global Political Economy at um, at Sussex. He's, um, his research interests include uh, global value chains and development, the political economy of development in Latin America, including rural and urban social movements, agrarian political economy, the global retail revolution and its impact on developing countries, and theories of development. And um, he's written two books. Um, one is called Workers, State and Development in Brazil, Powers of Labor, Chains of Value. That was published in 2012. Um, and was also shortlisted for the 2013 um, BISA International Political Economy Group Book Prize. And he's also written The Global Development Crisis, which was published in 2014. Um, and he's, he wrote this book um, to try and advance this concept of labor-centered development, which I'm sure he'll talk about um, today as well, which is... Um, attempting to overcome this paradox um, uh, between the simultaneous presence of mass wealth in the world that we've seen alongside uh, mass poverty. And currently, um, as I say, he's, he's writing this book called uh, The Struggle for Development. Um, so he'll speak um, for 45 minutes and then uh, we'll open it up for, uh, for questions and discussion. So, um, <laughs> And um, <laughs> Kalpana Wilson, we also have as discussant, but I will um, introduce her after um, after the talk. Thanks very much, Tracy, for the very kind introduction. Uh, that's work. Is that working? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. I did my PhD here for many years before the ESRC rules limited to four years. So I took about almost seven years to do my PhD. So I really enjoyed and appreciated being at SOAS and the, uh, the colleagues and the, uh, the students of which I was one. Um, and I've got a lot of my inspiration from being from uh, my time here. So this, <coughs> the talk is called a struggle for development. And when we think about development, it is one of those words like freedom and democracy that everyone loves and is for. No one is against it, really. Uh, it goes back a long way to the idea of the uh, good night, the good life, to the idea of happiness, human flourishing. Aristotle talked about, about it in terms of uh, eudaimonia. Uh, now people like Amartya Sen talk about it. Um, it's, it's one of those core ideas of uh, kind of civilizational ideas that we hold to. And it's very powerful. Uh, but I want to argue that the majority of development thinking is what George Orwell in his book in 1984 called uh, double think. Uh, in, George, in the book, Winston, who's the main character of 1984, uh, defines double think as follows. Uh, double think is the, the kind of uh, the ideology that the ruling uh, party uses to control people's thought. And he defines uh, double think as follows. He says, to know and not to know, to be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies, to use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it, to tell deliberate lies while genuinely believing in them, to deny the existence of objective reality and all the while take account of the reality which one denies. Uh, I think the mainstream and many variants of development thinking represent a form of double think. Uh, it's ideology that legitimates a complete opposite of what it claims to strive for. And it's in the book I'm going to call it the anti-poverty consensus. Again, everyone is against poverty. The UN, the World Bank, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, Bono, uh, everyone's against poverty. Uh, so the anti-poverty consensus holds to these kind of core truths, which is at the heart, I would say, of double thing. First of all, that continued economic growth represents the surest route towards poverty reduction and development. Secondly, that a rising number of people across the world are enjoying the fruits of this development. That this improvement is due to their increasing participation in global markets and, uh, of course, by 2030 with the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, we will be living in a world free of poverty. 
Now, that all sounds great, um, but that is the, the core of the APC, the anti-poverty consensus. Um, a lot of people see through this. My good friend Pope Francis says the following, to quote him. He talks about capitalism. He says, capitalism imposes the mentality of profit at any price, with no concern for social exclusion or the destruction of nature. This system is by now intolerable. Farm workers find it intolerable. Laborers find it intolerable. Communities find it intolerable. Peoples find it intolerable. The earth itself finds it intolerable. When you look a little bit more at the data from people who do not share the anti-poverty consensus idea of double think, you see uh, what he and what many people in this room and elsewhere uh, see as the real problem with the world. So, for example, Oxfam uh, produces a report every year, just right at the same time as Davos, and every single year they show that the global concentration of wealth is increasing. So last year they had this report and they show the following. <coughs> In 2015, 62 individuals owned the same wealth as 3.6 billion people, the bottom half of humanity. The wealth of the richest 62 people increased by 44% between 2010 and 2015, an increase of over half a trillion US dollars. During the same period, the wealth of the bottom 50% fell by over one trillion dollars. Uh, so you can see concentration of wealth and also uh, mass impoverishment as a consequence of that. So when we think about development, we need to think about what kind of development we're talking about. We can't just speak about development in empty terms. Otherwise, it's like talking about freedom, dignity, uh, liberty, democracy. You know, everyone can talk about this, uh, from Donald Trump to Hillary Clinton to every single person. No one is against these things. We have to be very clear about what it is we are talking about when we mean development. One alternative, which I'll come back towards at the end of the uh, talk, was... Uh, put forward, advanced by Franz Fanon in his book, The Wretched of the Earth. And I'll just read two quotes because he really captures what the problem is with mainstream development thinking and practice. He says, uh, this is written in the uh, late, well, I think in 1960, published in 1961, he says, the pretext of catching up must not, must not be used to push man around, to tear him away from himself or from his privacy, to break and kill him. Then he says, the European game has finally ended. We must find something different. We can, we today can do everything as long as we do not imitate Europe, so long as we are not obsessed by the desire to catch up with Europe. Uh, he was pointing at something very uh, fundamental in the way uh, people think about development and the way uh, it's portrayed as something to be aspired to. <clears throat> he was basically saying that the mentality of saying our way, our developed way, is the way that you should follow. What we know is good for you. We are the best. You can follow us. We have got medicine that you need. We are the healthy doctors. You are the sick patients. He was identifying this elite subject, subordinate object conception of social change, this elitist concept of social change in the social structure, which legitimates the exploitation and impoverishment of the poor on their behalf. You'll see that again and again. So why is this double thing so prevalent? When we think about... Uh, development and what I call capitalist development or capital centre development, what we see is the same people who talk about freedom, liberty, democracy and so on actually uh, justify an authoritarian version of social change which is capitalist development. Capitalist development is immensely and fundamentally authoritarian. Now one of the people that captured this very well in quite an honest way was W.W. W. Rostow and his theory of modernisation theory and his ideas of uh, stages of economic growth in the 1950s and 1960s, these ideas were becoming increasingly powerful uh, in the United States, in the State Department, and being projected across the world. Now, he uh, had his five stages of growth, traditional society, preconditions for takeoff, takeoff, drive to maturity, age of high mass consumption. And, you know, not many people today hold to the idea of modernization theory in its um, exactitude, as he spelled it out. But a lot of people do hold to its general thrust. And his arguments, I would argue, were as much as understanding the process of development as, as part of generating a mobilizing uh, ideology that could be used by the United States state, bureaucrats, academics, but especially for emergent ruling, post-colonial ruling classes and elites in the uh, so-called third world it was emerging. People like him, people like Samuel Huntington, all shared the same uh, concern, which was you had a whole range of 
uh, emerging post-colonial countries uh, throwing off in, uh, the colonial fetters and their fear, Rostos and Huntington's fear, was that these countries in so doing would actually go one step or two steps further, not just throw off the colonial oppressors, but actually uh, take a path towards something different, non-capitalist form of development, something that Franz Fanon was advocating. Rostow and Huntington were vehement that this was the wrong path. They formulated a whole range of theories, modernization theory, to make sure that this wouldn't happen. And in so doing, they justified with great theoretical precision and uh, sophistication, they justified mass murder, uh, oppression, dictatorship, uh, and so on. Their whole concern was to avoid uh, alternative forms of development. They wanted to make sure that the form of development that emerged in the less developed countries or third world or global south was capitalist development. So here I'm reading a quote from Rostow. It is in such a setting of political and social confusion, before the takeoff is achieved and consolidated politically and socially as well as economically, that the seizure of power by communist conspiracy is easiest. And this is a crucial bit. And it is in such a setting that a pro-capitalist centralized dictatorship may supply an essential technical precondition for takeoff and a sustained drive to maturity. Uh, I mean, many of uh, you guys uh, grew up in the uh, 90s and 2000s, and so this was the era of the third wave of democratization. But before that, it was quite uh, commonplace to really know that the US was behind all kinds of dictatorships around the uh, third world, and so was Russia. They both actually shared a common concern to uh, preclude any kind of uh, transformation generated from below and to manufacture and install a transformation from above, whether it was to be incorporated into the uh, free markets world system led by the United States or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the so-called communist system led by Russia. Now, most people look at modernization theory and probably laugh and say, this is nonsense. You read Gershon Kron about it, you read uh, any other people. I mean, you read Trotsky's idea of uneven and combined development, and you see that uh, modernization theory, Rostow's ideas was just a fancy, the idea that one country can follow another without any problems, the idea that the advanced countries show the backward countries uh, their future. Uh, so you can say, I'm not a modernization theorist, I am something else. But actually, within liberalism, within statism, within a lot of Marxism, the key uh, components of modernization theory are there and they loom very powerful and they structure our way of thinking. And what they do, basically, is to demobilize us from thinking about alternative paths of transformation. Uh, basically, these are stagist, Eurocentric and capital-centric forms of thinking. They see the already advanced uh, economies, well, the name says it all, advanced, uh, as the place to be going. They see uh, Europe as the uh, origin of uh, global capitalism, the kind of source, Anglo-European sphere as a source of civilization, and they're capital-centric. They see the only way of achieving development is through massive capital accumulation and essentially trickle-down forms of wealth uh, dispersal. And in, don't, in so doing, this form of stagism, Eurocentrism, capital centrism denies conceptually and politically the agency of the mass of the world's population to even think about their own form of uh, change, or their own form of development. It's basically saying to them, we've got the answers already, you just follow our advice and you'll be alright. And don't protest and don't oppose us. And this is the same for liberalism, statism and continental Marxism. Uh, and the key paradox, and this is why I call it double think, is that these theories and modernization theory, the way we think about it, basically uh, proclaims the benefits for the poor of the exploitation and oppression of the poor. It is good for you to be oppressed, it is good for you to be exploited, because the path we're going to, we know what lies ahead, you don't, we know what lies ahead, and what's in the future is good for you, that's why you should support us, and bow down and let, uh, and succumb to the exploitation and oppression that you uh, face. Now, I'm going to show that by looking just at a few kind of examples, a few texts, a few quotes, that really, I think, encapsulates a lot of these uh, way of thinking within these uh, traditions. And they go further. So, for example, the Washington Consensus, the bad old days of the 1980s neoliberalism, at its starkest, at its most kind of extreme, the idea of getting, market, getting prices right, solving all of the uh, problems of the, uh, the, the, uh, the less developed countries, um, 
economies. Uh, so within the uh, Washington Consensus, there's an idea which is quite powerful about uh, perfect markets and how markets can function, uh, but uh, when they suffer from imperfections, they don't function properly. So it is the role of uh, states in a slightly paradoxical way, because the early neoliberals really pushed the idea of the state aside. It's the role of the state to <coughs> remove these imperfections. So what are these imperfections? Well, um, well, one of the core imperfections that a lot of uh, <coughs> states in the global south were held to suffer from uh, was the idea of a labour market inflexibility or labour market uh, imperfection. And Robert Solow, in one of his uh, uh, lectures, defined a labour market inflexibility. <coughs> so I quote, A labour market <coughs> is inflexible if the level of unemployment insurance benefit is too high or the duration is too long. <coughs> or if there are too many restrictions on the freedom of employers to fire and to hire, or if the permissible hours of work are too tightly regulated, <clears throat> or if excessively generous compensation for overtime work is mandated, <clears throat> or if trade unions have too much power to protect incumbent workers against competition and to control the flow of work at the site of production, or perhaps if statutory health and safety regulations are too stringent. <clears throat> Basically, Anything that's good for workers is a labour market imperfection. Uh, this is a very clearly articulated uh, ideology to steamroller uh, trade unions and any kind of uh, collective action institutions that protects workers. And it is justified in a whole range of theories. Anne Kruger, the uh, <coughs> World Bank's chief economist, between 1992 and 1986, argues, and I quote, that with a sufficiently low urban wage, a zero unemployment level is a feasible outcome. You can have full employment, but you have to have very low wages. We are doing you a favour by removing all these imperfections. To By pushing wages down, we will actually increase employment generation. <clears throat> so you see, they are the elites. They have the knowledge. They impart that knowledge to the rest of the population. They justify the structural adjustment of society to remove any barriers to capital accumulation uh, in the name of helping the poor. <clears throat> Okay, so we all, I mean, it'll be interesting to know if there are any neoliberals here. Uh, I doubt it. Not at SOAS. Um, not really anywhere. I mean, you don't find many of them these days. They're all quite sophisticated these days. But, so people say, I'm not a neoliberal. I like, uh, who do I like? I like the status. I like Ha Jun Chang's Kicking Away the Ladder. I like that tradition. And when you read Kicking Away the Ladder, it's a fantastic book in many ways because it destroys the uh, free market ideologies. <clears throat> but that status tradition, which goes back to Alexander Hamilton and uh, Friedrich List, uh, is presenting itself in many good ways as a progressive alternative to uh, neoliberalism. Because it has a more realistic understanding of the world market. It doesn't talk about things like perfect markets, perfect competition. It understands that free trade is... Uh, not a leveller, but a uh, mechanism for creating uh, more inequality. So it has a good critique, and uh, it can point with great uh, precision to all the cases where uh, less developed countries have used states to their advantage to achieve a rapid economic growth, structural diversification, industrialisation, and so on. But when you actually look at the status political economy analysis themselves, you see a dark underbelly, which is... <clears throat> very similar to the neoliberals, and it uh, subscribes absolutely to the idea of stagism, uh, Eurocentrism, capital centrism, <clears throat> and it reproduces the elite subject subordinate object uh, perspective uh, completely. <clears throat> so Alice Amsden, who was one of the kind of big thinkers in the late 1980s, early 1990s, to, to really kind of break the, start breaking the neoliberal uh, uh, hold over development thinking in her work in South Korea, people like Robert Wade also on um, Taiwan and many others as well. Um, but just to quote Alice Amsden about the South Korean experience, a high profits in its mass production industries have been derived not merely from investments in machinery and modern work methods, which is what the what that status all is going about, but also from the lo world's longest working week. Then she says, alongside effective investments, Cheap labour and labour repression is the basis of late industrialisation everywhere. When you read that article, it's the New Left Review from 1979, you're not, well, 
I find it a bit hard to understand if she's actually praising it or merely reflecting on it. But nevertheless, she does see this as uh, the way to achieve late industrialization. And to quote her again, the average wages of women workers have lagged far behind those of men, enabling employers in labor-intensive industries to remain internationally competitive alongside the growth of the mass production sector. Wage discrimination against women in Korea and Japan is the worst in the world. Uh, one of uh, uh, um, Daeop Chang, who uh, I think, I'm not sure if he's still at size, but uh, he's uh, wrote some really great material on uh, South Korea. Uh, he showed that the South Korean industrial experiment was based on uh, massive denial of democracy, democracy dictatorship, uh, terror, uh, concentration camps. So we've got the statists. I mean, there's many more examples of that. You can read um, in my book on the global development crisis. I've got two chapters where I talk about that in quite a lot of length. I provide quote after quote, textual analysis, uh, showing how uh, labour repression is the norm and is absolutely essential. So, okay, you could say, well, I'm a science, I'm radical. Uh, neither neoliberalism nor statism. They're two sides of the same coin. I reject both of them. I'm something else. Well, where is that something else? Uh, a lot of people go towards Marxism, rightly, but they end up in the wrong part of the Marxist uh, framework. And some Marxism reproduces the, uh, exactly the things that we've been uh, talking about um, just right here. Uh, so, for example, um, I mean, there's a very famous book called Imperialism, Pioneer of Capitalism by Bill Warren, who, who talks about capitalism in, as a very dynamic force. It is very dynamic but it's also extremely destructive. And uh, if you just focus on the dynamism, then the destructive side uh, really falls away and it seems like you're celebrating capitalist dynamism. And there are a lot of Marxists who do celebrate uh, capitalist dynamism. So, for example, um, some people from SIAS, in fact, uh, from the uh, 1980s, they, read, they wrote about the uh, development of capitalism in Africa and they wrote things as... Uh, following, the rapid accumulation is unlikely to be achieved without significant reductions in the real incomes of a substantial portion of the population. Um, to uh, achieve such accumulation, they wrote, Af African states would need to contain subnational pres sub pressures through, and I quote again, a combination of hegemonic official nationalism and the military means to reinforce this ideology. A method must be devised for the appropriation of sufficient surplus to ensure the smooth functioning of the military and repressive apparatus. Um, I mean, that for me, I don't see what's Marxist about that at all. That just seems like another version of statism. And in a way, if you are talking about catch-up development, uh, that is the industrialization, the thing that Fanon said we shouldn't be aspiring for, if you are talking about that catch-up development, then yes, that is probably what is necessary. And what you see then is you have three very powerful traditions, liberalism, statism, and some strands of Marxism, which really uh, advocate uh, the oppression and exploitation of the poor on behalf of the poor. It sets up an elite subject subordinate object situation and really uh, legitimates what none of us would consider to be uh, development. It actually legitimates the opposite of many of us would intuitively think to be as development. So what then is the uh, alternative? How do we think about the alternative? Um, so in my uh, book, The Global Development Tr Crisis, I, I talk about this concept of labour-centred development. And um, a, lot of, a lot of Marxists talk uh, in terms of a, a utopian future. Uh, after capitalism, we can have real human development. Or in order to get real human development, we need to get rid of capitalism. Uh, yes, but what about now? I mean, we're talking about generations um, of a huge amount of time before that utopia will be realised, if ever. Um, what about the here and now? Uh, do we mean, do we just uh, have nothing to say about the contemporary uh, situation of uh, human development across uh, the global south and the north, in fact? Um, my argument is that the idea of labour-centred development enables us to both think in utopian terms. It's good to be utopian. It's good to think about a positive future. You know? uh, a lot of people say, oh, you should be realistic. What they mean is you should not think about any kind of alternative at all and just accept what there is. Uh, there is no alternative. No, we should think about the uh, possibilities of a future, but we have to root that in the contemporary uh, situation. And the idea of labour-centred development uh, does that in two ways. First of all, it views the development process from the perspective of labouring classes. 
I think that's a really important thing to do because, uh, as you've seen with these three perspectives, those three perspectives really see labouring classes simply as inputs into the industrialisation process, uh, as men and women to be controlled, manipulated, crushed, <coughs> pushed into work and disciplined. The labour process is the domain of the capitalist where he or she can completely dominate the worker. The worker is just another commodity like the uh, wood or metal that's being transformed into something else. Their labour power is the property, once the contract has been signed, of the capitalist, and the capitalist must be able to do everything they want to do with that property. That is the ideal of a uh, uh, perfect labour market with no imperfections, where the capitalists have absolute control of the use of the uh, labour power of the worker. So if you start looking at the development process from the perspective of labouring classes, uh, then you start thinking, well, this doesn't seem quite right. Uh, we can't really have uh, someone dominating us and forcing us around and lying to us and uh, doing all kinds of uh, awful, uh, harmful things to us, making us work 15-hour working weeks, subject to all kinds of pollution uh, and so on, mortally threatening us in many ways. That's the first thing to do. I'll come on to the idea, we can talk about the idea of how you think about the labouring class, but that's a, a first uh, uh, position. And secondly, the second aspect of labour-centred development is to think about what it is and how it is, how do labouring classes shape the development processes uh, in their favour through their own or potential collective actions. Uh, once you ask that question, and you start finding uh, lots of examples, but you also get away from this idea of the elite subject subordinate object conception of social change, where the objects, the subordinate objects, have no agency at all, where the subordinate objects actually start becoming the agents of their own transformation. Another way of thinking about it is that in the elite subject subordinate object conception of social change, the primary agency is allocated to uh, elites, uh, state bureaucrats, uh, corporate uh, CEOs, um, even uh, NGO uh, leaders, some of them, um, and so on. Uh, and secondary agency is allocated to uh, workers who perform what is necessary as defined by the primary agents, by the uh, capitalists or by the uh, agents of uh, elite transformation. What the labour-centred development conception starts to do is to say, well, that's certainly true, that's certainly the way that these people want the world to be, but it's not always the case, and it's sometimes the case that primary agency is taken up through collective action by labouring classes themselves. Their actual collective actions can be transformative, can lead to real human development in ways that are much more progressive and much more realisable and instant, instantaneous than uh, that uh, uh, espoused by uh, elite uh, conceptions of social change. So you, you reverse it and suddenly the whole range of uh, development looks very different. You start seeing the world in a very different way. Ways. Now, that's basically what I was saying in the, uh, in the book. And then the next book, I've realised, because I, I, I I've done quite a few of these talks, and I've got lots of concerned people who say, yeah, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying, or most of it, uh, but what about us? Surely we're the elites. There's nothing, what you're saying, there's nothing for us to do. People get very disturbed. They think, oh, this is all about proletarian revolution and so on. There's nothing for us to do apart from, uh, I don't know, uh, give interesting commentary. Hopefully. Um, but not at all. So I was thinking about that. I said, well, you know, maybe this is me falling back into some kind of, uh, you know, kind of reformist tendencies. But I, I then thought, well, you can actually subdivide the concept of labour centred development a little bit further. Uh, and you can think about pro labour development, you can talk about labour driven development, and you can talk about labour led development. I'll talk about the last one most. But in terms of pro labour development, um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, John Passenden, has written a book about. Uh, the state uh, and development in rural India, and he coined, he uses the phrase pro pro labour development, and he shows that the uh, uh, the national rural unemployment guarantee scheme, which basically allocates uh, guarantees 100 days paid labour to the unemployed in rural areas, is an exa he calls it an example of pro labour development, uh, and so I adopt the uh, phrase from him because it uh, generates gains for uh, the destitute workers, the destitute unemployed, and he also shows how with this uh, income, with this uh, work that takes some of the workers away from some of the more uh, kind of forms of bonded labour and much more forms of oppressive labour, in some situations it gives them uh, uh, 
power to engage in some kind of collective actions. So yes, uh, elites can do good things. There can be pro-labour development. There can be uh, good things handed down from the state. Uh, and that is basically where progressive development studies stops. They say, yes, we want good things to be done by elites for the poor, uh, but, and, and that, I certainly want more of that rather than less of that, but the problem with that is that you still reproduce the elite subject subordinate object uh, situation. Uh, you don't see, you don't uh, perceive of the primary agency <coughs> that uh, labouring classes can generate through their own collective actions. The second category is what I call labour driven development, which is where, through collective actions or the threat of collective actions, uh, labouring classes can force elites to uh, to uh, provide uh, real, tangible developmental gains. I mean, the high point of this, in many ways, I would say, was the uh, formation of the welfare states in uh, post Second World War Europe. I mean, this came after something like 30 years of mass struggles. I mean, going back to even before the uh, Russian Revolution, there's this huge wave of struggles sweeping Europe from 1910 onwards. The Russian Revolution, uh, the uh, mass uprisings in Spain. And one of the uh, responses by the European ruling classes and the American ruling classes was to institute the New Deal or the um, welfare states. As Quintin Hogg, who is, or Lord Hailsham, uh, one of these Tory MPs, uh, famously said, either we give them social reform or they give us social revolution. The threat from below engendered a response, a progressive response from above. <coughs> Obviously that response was contradictory. Um, it was, had all kinds of limitations to it, but it was a huge uh, progressive move. If you've seen Ken Loach's uh, film, The Spirit of 45, you can critique it because it misses lots of things out, but it did uh, deliver real development gains. So those two things are definitely should be on the table in our thinking about development, but it's the third bit, the labour-driven development, that I think is uh, really important to think about in, when we consider uh, social change. This is the idea of First of all, you have to have the idea, primary, secondary agency. Then you have to search around for it and think about what is it about uh, labouring class collective actions that can generate uh, development gains through their own collective actions themselves. Now, this is where we start to think again about uh, capitalism. And a lot of um, Marxist analysis is quite narrow in the sense that it can be seen as uh, productivist Marxism, where it looks at the workplace and it... it sees the workplace uh, and usually the kind of white male worker or just the male worker as the, the kind of core, uh, core agent of social change. Um, and this is, um, obviously this is one aspect of it, but in this global globalising world that we have today, neoliberal world, we see that you have processes of labour fragmentation uh, across the world, you have mass unemployment, you have over a billion people without formal sector work, you have all kinds of different types of work. So obviously a productivist Marxist approach is kind of limited. Uh, it rules out uh, a lot of the collective actions that exist around the world and also it has a limited, I think, uh, conception of um, capitalism itself. What uh, I think is necessary is the uh, social reproduction approach, which is where Marxism and feminism come together, the radical, fam uh, ra radical aspects of uh, or socialist feminism come together. And so it's the production of surplus value in the workplace where Labour is directly exploited by capital, but it's also about the reproduction of the labour force, the second circuit uh, of the reproduction of uh, labour in the household, in the community, beyond the workplace. This is what uh, Harry Cleaver calls this social factory. It's not just a factory, it's a social factory, it's capitalist society as a whole. I mean, when we think about the division between the workplace and beyond the workplace, the household and the community, you have to ask yourself the question, you can't just assume that the labour force is there ready for capital to exploit. You have to ask the question, why is it there? Why is it exploitable? How is it being produced? Why do we have this division between the workplace, the productive sphere, and the unproductive, uh, non-remunerative, uh, non-important sphere where women's work is uh, free and is undervalued? Why is that the case? Well, if you read uh, Silvia Federici and a lot of radical feminism and critical Marxism, you see that actually this is part and parcel of the emergence of capitalism was the creation of these two spheres. Just as you have the public and private sphere, you have the workplace and the um, beyond the workplace where the, where the labour forces are reproduced. Once you see that, then you, once you have that perception of the social reproduction of capitalism, once you have the idea of labour-led development, suddenly um, a whole range of 
collective action, social struggles from below are on the table to be uh, appreciated and understood as developmental. And in many ways, these are uh, more impressive and more uh, beneficial uh, than other forms of development that are advocated by traditional elite theories of social change uh, advocates of development. Now, I mean, there are many examples of that. But just to mention a few, I mean, the sh shack dwellers movement uh, in parts of South Africa. Uh, I mean, these are the so-called, uh, I mean, you could, uh, the, the collateral damage of, uh, of the, uh, the process of industrialization in South Africa where um, you have mass unemployment. Uh, according to elite theory, these unemployed should just be passive. Uh, but, of course, being passive is not uh, uh, an option where you don't have any kind of welfare state. And so a lot of these uh, movements have engaged in collective actions to uh, force municipalities to uh, connect electricity, to provide sanitation, to provide houses, to build houses, to repair them, and so on. Uh, these uh, collective actions from below have been quite uh, important in uh, securing and ameliorating the social reproduction of the uh, informal reserve army of labor, laboring class in the uh, shanty towns across parts of South Africa. Um, I read a recent, uh, very good special issue of a uh, review of African political economy recently about the uh, la labor, and, uh, labor in the time of platinum. Uh, sent, is caused, the reason this special issue came out was because of the uh, Marikana mine massacre uh, in 2012. Um, and there's a fantastic uh, article in there by uh, um, a PhD student called uh, Asanda Benya, who looks at the, uh, the, the workers in the Marikana mines. I mean, these uh, platinum workers are massively super exploited. They're paid uh, very low wages. And actually, the only reason they can work at all is because uh, of their social arrangements, where the women who don't get paid for this obviously provide them with the social support uh, necessary to uh, live. They, they get up early in the morning, they provide them with water to, to drink, to clean with, uh, they look after them, they nurse them basically because this is quite a murderous kind of work. And she also showed how in the uh, struggles around 2012 before and, and after the massacre, it was the uh, women uh, in the home basically and in the community who are supporting the male workers. So to have this idea that it's just male workers in struggle directly against the capitalist exploiters is to have a very limited conception of the idea of capitalist social reproduction. Another example is the landless labourers movement in uh, Brazil. Uh, again, something like 30 million people are forced off the land uh, following the conservative modernisation in 1964, where the dictatorship decided to modernise Brazilian agriculture, concentrate it, capitalise it, uh, intensify it and so on, uh, push it even further towards export promotion. They went into the cities, into the favelas, the shanty towns and so on. And from the early 1980s, there was a, a kind of re-ruralization movement. The MST, the Movimento dos Trabalhadores Sem Terra, uh, began taking over invading land and setting up their communities. Now, obviously, there are all kinds of issues with these communities. I mean, they, these are not rich communities, uh, but the alternative was being uh, basically flotsam on the heap of the reserve army of labor created by uh, rural modernization. Rather than remaining as passive uh, victims of the modernization process, uh, these uh, workers in the informal sector took agency into their own hands through collective actions, set up their own communities, and now they've also expanded to the uh, another movement the, um, that actually works in the urban areas, reclaiming and taking over houses uh, to live in, a uh, basic uh, essential aspect of social reproduction. Um, other examples, uh, the mass strikes in South Korea, again, um, in the 1980s, not only did they uh, contribute to the bringing about the democracy, but they also contributed to uh, pushing wages up. I mean, these mass strikes and mass movements from below, you have to remember, South Korea, Brazil, uh, and South Africa, they were changed fundamentally by these mass movements from below. Uh, in contemporary China, uh, the mass struggles uh, by industrial workers and many uh, second generation immigrant workers now for their pension rights, for better wages, for better representation uh, within the, uh, the kind of national trade union um, has led to new labor laws and in some ways uh, progressive uh, laws being implemented in some ways in a very contradictory way. Um, other examples, I mean in, in uh, Argentina you've had the unemployed workers, the picateros, you had the occupied factory workers who took over factories and ran them. These factories were going to be shut down. 
by the owners in the crisis of profitability following the 2001 crash. Um, the the, the uh, choice, again, was to be a passive victim or to uh, establish some kind of primary agency through collective action, take over the factories. And in some of these factories, I've written, uh, I co-written an article with um, a friend of mine, and he's done very uh, detailed uh, research into this, showing that some of these factories actually have higher productivity under workers' control than under the former manager's control. And one of the reasons for that is because the, uh, the mentality of work is quite different. There's a very different mentality of work when you're working together for the, a common good, or something could be described as a common good, than when you're working from, uh, f for a manager who wants to push you as hard as possible for the least gain uh, possible. Uh, so, and he, in the article, it's in Geo Forum, it's called Labor Centered Development in Latin America. We also look back to the example in 1972 73 in Chile, uh, where you had the Allende government, but you also had the uh, Cordones Industriales, this huge industrial belt springing up with workers taking over factories, organizing communities, and distributing um, uh, means of production uh, between themselves and reorientating production for the common good, towards the common good. Uh, there are many examples. I mean, one of the things uh, that I think the critical development studies uh, students, uh, we are all development studies students, what we can do is to try and identify these cases of labour-led development, as I call them, yeah, as a means of combating the elitism that you find in the mainstream development journal and the mainstream development courses. Basically, to conclude, <coughs> these movements that I've mentioned and many others what they do is, uh, not only do they reverse or attempt to reverse the uh, elite subject subordinate object relationship in the development process, they redefine development. They, their process of development is against oppression and against exploitation. Fundamentally, all of these organisations talk in these terms. In many ways, they demystify the double think that clouds our perception and presents itself masquerades as development thinking. Uh, they redefine social value. Rather than production for profit, which is the underpinning of the uh, double think of contemporary capitalist development, they say we should be producing for need. And in some cases, they've done so reasonably successfully. And they redefine democratic participation. Uh, contemporary democracy in this country across much of the world is what people like Chomsky and uh, Gills and Rakamora called low-intensity democracy, lit. Basically, you elect someone every five years, they misrepresent you, and you get along happily because, well, no one's dying. But, I mean, that's the uh, low-intensity democracy variety of it, which is, eh, it's, it's not quite a lie, but it is, it's uh, something's there to be desired. They reinvent democracy through much higher levels of participation. I'm not saying that we should aspire to a life spent in meetings, I mean, I can't stand meetings, but uh, these, this is a higher level of democratic participation than ever before. Secondly, these are prefigurative movements. What I mean by that fancy term is to say that these democratically organised collective actions engender democratic ends and democratic structures. It's fundamentally different to the kind of elite subject, subordinate object uh, concept of development where you just have endless capital accumulation, output for the sake of output, accumulation for the uh, sake of accumulation. So to sum up, really, uh, labour-led development and labour-centred development, this is... Obviously, I have a utopia of a world where, I mean, there's enough food in the world now that no one needs to go hungry. I mean, the, the, the social wealth that exists under capitalism is there to make everyone's life uh, pretty good. The reason it's not good is because of the social relations of capitalism. So you can quite easily foresee a much better world that is uh, beyond competition, beyond exploitation. But uh, I'm not just talking about this utopia in the future. I'm saying in the here and now, at this minute, around past the... Uh, all, all parts of the world, there are struggles, collective actions for the amelioration of labour and class uh, livelihoods for their communities in the workplaces beyond. These are the examples of labour-led, labour-centred development, which we can look to uh, as inspiring and as uh, rethinking the development process and as trying to uh, engage in solidarity and rethinking how we can actually uh, change uh, the world, how we can move from here to there. And just to end with a quote from one of the uh, participants in one of the factory occupations that I mentioned a few minutes ago. It says, this process of factory occupation and recovery is big because what one has regarded as utopia has become now necessary and possible. If we could take this to a regional country world level, we would be talking about another world. Uh, development, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is an idea of hope, of progress, of liberty, 
of equality, of fraternity. It's these kinds of uh, transformations that we all of us want to see. Uh, and the aim, I think, of uh, progressive development thinking, <coughs> development studies, development action practice is to have, find a way of understanding how the human flourishing of each <coughs> is the precondition for the human flourishing of all. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, I should also say, if anyone uh, wants to tweet uh, in this discussion session or has already been tweeting, um, or if you'd like to tweet, the, the hashtags as always are um, SOAS Dev Studies and also ESRC. Um, we're very uh, pleased also to um, welcome back uh, Kalpana Wilson. Kalpana was also involved in the seminar series last year. Um, Kalpana uh, teaches at Birkbeck. She was formerly a uh, senior LSE fellow in Gender Theory, Globalization and Development at LSE's Gender Institute. Um, and she's written and researched uh, extensively on agrarian transformation in uh, Bihar, uh, in India, women's participation in rural labor movements, concepts of agency, um, the appropriation of feminist ideas within neoliberal discourses, um, and the ways in which race is inscribed uh, within development. And she's written a book on race racism and um, and development uh, that was published in 2012 by Zed um, and the book uh, combines insights from post-colonial and critical race theory um, within a political economy frame framework and it puts forward um, provocative uh, theoretical analyses of the relationships between labor um, race capital and resistance and she's written a lot of articles on um, um, women's neoliberal development in uh, women and neoliberal development um, in India so she's just going to uh, say a few words to draw out some of the, the themes in Ben's talk uh, and then we'll open it out for um, questions Thanks. okay well thank you very much um, Faisi, um, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this very, very um, interesting um, session. Um, and um, one of the things I really liked about um, about the ideas which um, Ben was discussing um, was the fact that, you know, on the one hand, um, it reminded me of um, some of the insights of post-development theory, which, um, of course, goes beyond um, critiques of particular development models um, and really um, highlights the way in which, um, um, you know, as he puts it, elite-led development has um, over and over again in different contexts marginalized those who are constructed as being the objects of development. Um, and uh, denied them any agency in the development process. But what he does, unlike um, a lot of the post-development theorists, um, is to recognize that um, people's movements themselves have an agenda of social transformation. That um, coming out of these movements is um, our particular visions of development, um, are also very often ideas of progress. Um, and, of course, recognizing that these movements uh, continue very often to be informed by particular understandings of Marxism and inspired by them. Um, so, in a way, it then avoids that whole trap of kind of romanticizing um, communities as kind of static and somehow outside of development, which, you know, we see in a lot of the post-development literature and really... Um, you know, does focus, give us the opportunity to focus on uh, the visions of development which um, movements are putting forward. Um, so as Faisi said, I'm just going to really throw out there a few, a few questions, um, and I'm not going to speak for very long. Um, one of the things which I was wondering about, um, about what you talked about was whether um, in this framework it tends to assume quite a, an even spread of um, uh, of capital labor relations, of capitalist relations, social relations. Um, you know, because you talk about uh, the labor process a lot, and I wonder how within this framework then we address contexts where um, non-capitalist relations are in fact being sustained and incorporated into patterns of global capital accumulation. Um, so while I think you have quite a broad um, definition of labor classes, uh, do we perhaps need to go even beyond this, for example, to, to understand um, 
uh, the current uh, whole range of indigenous struggles against dispossession which are going on, which in many places in the world are the kind of foremost um, struggles against um, capital accumulation. And also, um, you know, because you mentioned, of course, imperialism and those, you know, self-styled Marxists who, who uh, used to talk about um, imperialism as a progressive force at the beginning, but I wondered where, um, where you saw imperialism fitting into this framework. Um, because, of course, you know, when we talk about Fano, that's really uh, very much what he was talking about. And then, of course, you know, um, Rostow, for example, was, as we know, the, the founder of modernization theory, but he was also the person who, um, who lobbied for the uh, escalation of the bombing of Vietnam at the same time. Um, so those sorts of, of structures which make... Um, particular laboring lives more valued than others, how does that fit in with this framework? Um, I was also, you know, um, very interested that you, you know, made social reproduction quite central to your, to your analysis. Um, but I was wondering about the way in which um, there are changes in the way in which gender is, is structurally incorporated in, in um, in global capitalism and in process of accumulation, how it's changing through um, you know, this huge process of feminization of labor. Um, why, you know, slogans like gender equality, smart economics have, have now got so much um, purchase. You know, I would see them very much as being about the extension and intensification of women's labor um, within the market. Um, on top of all the care work and the reproductive work, which continues. Um, and how are these relationships also incorporated into these, um, into these um, labor movements which you're talking about? You know, for example, you know, how, do, how does unpaid care work actually sustain them in many contexts? Um, and finally, I wanted to just sort of pick up on this idea of the importance of recognizing, um, recognizing these movements as development actors, which you which you talk about. Um, I mean, I think that's that's important. Although I think it's potentially very much uh, open to co-option as well. You know, we already hear a lot about civil society organisations as development actors. Um, you know, we hear about stakeholders and so on. But I, 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 my sense is that you mean something very different from that. Um, but what I do think is really very interesting is this whole idea of um, actors and agents and how we conceive of agency in a collective context. Um, because, of course, the dominant idea about agency is very much around the idea of the, the individual. Um, so I, I wondered, you know, firstly, of course, this raises questions of how movements themselves are internally structured and whether power relations are, are reproduced there or if they're challenged. Um, but also, I think, you know, the question of understanding agency and collective movements is something very, very interesting and important. Um, and how do we transcend, you know, on the one hand, the notion of false consciousness, um, which tends to then rep reproduce the, the idea that uh, movements are really only galvanized through exposure to external ideas, so that which has been there very much within some strands of Marxism. Um, but on the other hand, we have to also transcend this liberal conception of movements as a collection of uh, rational, self-interested individuals who will come together and take action simply because the conditions are right. Um, so I think in order to do this, we really need to think about the difference which the collective makes in thinking about agency. Um, and just as a last um, question, um, I really was interested in this idea of prefigurative movements, and I suppose I just wanted to raise the question of the state again. Um, you know, is, is the capture of the state by these movements really ultimately the objective, and if so, uh, what would the state then look like? Thank you, Kapana. Um So, well, um, you can respond, or you can we can open it up um, to the floor. However, have you want to, or you can just have a little response, and then and then we can open it up to the floor. Also, I just want to say, um, whoever is standing, there are a few seats, or if you if you're standing at the back and you want to sit down, feel free. 
Um, or if there's anyone outside, is there anyone outside anymore? Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Okay, I mean, these are great, great questions. Um, so in terms, just to run through a couple of things very briefly, and then maybe we can take them a bit further. Uh, the indigenous struggles against um, <clears throat> dispossession. Um, so in the book I'm writing now, I, I conceptualise capitalism as being based on uh, exploitation of labour by capital, but it's also fundamentally about the appropriation of the free gifts of nature, the social construction of nature as something that can deliver free gifts time and again. And that deliverance of free gifts is the process of dispossession. And so that opens up the space for considering these indigenous movements resisting dispossession as part of a resistance to the social reproduction of capitalism. Um, I know it would, you know, and of course there are all kinds of um, problems there because within <coughs> indigenous movements you also have processes of class differentiation and so on, uh, which you have to be aware of. You can't be, you can't romanticise them at all. But at the same time, uh, if you think about creating alliances, uh, progressive alliances, I would def definitely see these anti-dispossession movements as part and parcel of the same uh, potential uh, movement to stop the, uh, the negative dialectic of capitalist expansion. Um, <clears throat> changes in gender, I mean, you've written very much about this. Uh, I've read some of your work on the train up here. It's fantastic. So I'd reference you uh, to answer that question. Um, one of the phrases I've uh, uh, <coughs> found from reading um, <coughs> around the subject is um, uh, Amy Height and Jocelyn Viterna wrote this book about the class structure in Latin America showing this feminization of uh, the labor force. And uh, as you say in much of your work, this feminization of the labor force is celebrated by neoliberals as uh, empower, empowering women. What they show in their article is, yes, there's more inequality, but it's downward inequality. Women are equal to men because men are now worse off. So it's like the w women's bad conditions to start with have been replicated across the labor force. Um, in many ways, it makes sense. You've got more workers um, competing against each other. It's going to push wages down. Uh, and they also use the phrase of shock absorbers, where with the retreat of any kind of welfare state and welfare provision, women have to uh, undertake the double, or as you put it, the triple burden even more um, intensely. I mean, the work itself, the household work and community work. Uh, but they also point out, as you do, uh, it had this this process of degradation also has within the potential for progressive uh, social change as well. Um, cooptation, obviously, <clears throat> and this does raise the question of political leadership, which is very difficult to uh, come to a, a very clear um, answer. I mean, <clears throat> Leninism posits itself as having the solutions, but Leninist parties have repeatedly shown themselves to be unable to do that very uh, successfully. So I have to say I'm not quite sure what the solution is, but I don't think we need to have all the solutions at our hands. Um, and in terms of uh, state capture and prefigurative movements, I mean, in, uh, <clears throat> in his writings about the Paris Commune, Marx talks about the state as and the, the, where the Commune reabsorbed state into society, rather than this uh, monolith standing over society and dominating it and policing it. Uh, in, in a very forceful way, the state became reabsorbed and uh, it was staffed by the, uh, the communards and it became something quite different. Um, so that, that is a pointer towards what could be the actual, from here to there, the politics of doing that is a big, big question which uh, I wouldn't feel too happy by saying this is the road, comrades. You know, I've got some ideas but definitely not all of them. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, okay, so questions, um, Francesco. Just indicate. Thanks very much for your questions. I've got two questions. One is related with the last one. Just speak up a bit if you can. Yeah. 
shut up yourself less. So, that not necessarily in this case has to be an Okay, thanks. So just indicate, um, and I think we'll take a couple of rounds. So Joe, and then yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Very interesting talk, but I think I'm in the wrong part of Marxism, where this labour-led development, it seems to me that to begin with, you need labour, you need capitalism, you need classes, you need capital-labour relations. So is it not then the case that the Warrenite Marxism that you criticised is actually necessary, first of all, before your labour-led development is possible? And therefore, places that don't have much modern industry at the moment, don't they need a pro-capital strategy to get big capitalist investment before your uh, labour-focused development is even a possible, viable thing? Thanks. Uh, yeah, and then, and then you in the white shirt. Then you. Did you put your hand up? So it was a hand there, yeah. yeah. 
Yep, uh, <laughs> fleetingly. Um, <laughs> so the first point is about a passive revolution. I mean, that's one outcome, but that's not the objective. And I mean, the, the uh, that's certainly not the idea that you, I mean, passive revolution would probably fit into the framework of um, <clears throat> kind of labor-driven development and the combination of that and pro-labor development. Oppressions from below generate transformations from above. But uh, the point about labor-led development is actually it uh, delivers uh, material gains to the uh, laboring classes and their communities and potentially leads to broader transformations and creates more space for further transformations. So I don't see that as a passive revolution. Um, I see that as an active process of uh, transformation, whether you want to call it... Well, I'll come on to the question of... Uh, whether you call it revolution in a second. Um, can we have a society beyond exploitation, surplus generation, and degrowth? I mean, I think from what I've read about the degrowth, a bit like post-development, it's a great idea, <coughs> very attractive. It identifies many of the problems with capitalism in its ceaseless kind of accumulation. But it's not a based in political economy. Uh, it doesn't have a kind of political economy analysis, neither degrowth nor... Um, <coughs> nor the post-development uh, theory, and they don't really have um, an analysis of capitalism. I mean, Trotsky said, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And you could say the same thing to the degrowth and post-development. You may not be interested in capitalism, but capitalism is interested in you. I mean, it takes over everything. It's like cancer, expands and incorporates everything. So <clears throat> in po the question of degrowth, I would reframe it and say, there's nothing intrinsically impossible about having a genuinely sustainable world where we continue to produce things, transform nature into things that we need, transform whatever we're going to call it. Um, that could be considered growth, but what it's not is accumulation for the sake of accumulation, which I think is the root cause of environmental destruction and uh, exploitation, uh, which comes back to the question of surplus uh, generation. Um, <clears throat> I think through... Okay, so what I say about prefigurative movements, I mean, if we just look at them for a moment, uh, we see the emergence of, uh, I wouldn't say that these are the uh, solutions to the world's problems, today's solutions for tomorrow's problems. I mean, they are, they are the potential uh, indicators of what could be. Uh, if you take a much longer view and show the kind of high level of democratic participation, you can see the possibilities of creating surpluses would be generated through a much more a higher level of democratic participation, decision making, resource allocation, decisions about what is going to be produced, what's not going to be produced. I mean, you can have, you know, you can have quite local level production where people produce uh, <clears throat> many things that they need um, for use, you, the production of use values. I think you can, you don't necessarily need to have a uh, overriding. Uh, oppressive state to guarantee surplus generation. You can have surplus generation within the concept, concept of more democratic uh, means of uh, organisation. I mean, I write about this in a book in the last uh, chapter. I mean, I draw very much on Michael Leibovitz's work, uh, who I find uh, really useful for this. Um, I agree. I mean, these, a lot of these, uh, some of these occupied uh, factories do engage in self-exploitation. And of course, you cannot have an island of socialism in a sea of capitalism. This can only be the start if this is going to be the future. Uh, otherwise, it'll be uh, rolled back. Um, so yes, of course, that is a uh, likelihood in this scenario. But it creates a kind of contradictory situation which can go in many different directions, one of them which is to further expand into the economy, into society, into politics, and start subjecting more and more of resource production and allocation to democratic control. So I, I see that as potentially uh, progressive. So in terms of politics and class consciousness, um, you know, the very first thing is to say, I think, is that collective actions themselves generate a new realisation of the world, throw up new questions and demand new solutions. And it's in that process that you do have new forms of energy, new human resources, if you want to call that, are created through collective actions where people cooperate, work together, debate together, a whole new range of... Um, um, I mean, I was reading uh, Kalpana's piece, uh, uh, Development and Change article, from 2015, and you gave the example of um, some of the um, Indian, Indian uh, I think it was the landless um, communities, 
fighting for land reform and in the process, as I understood it, uh, highlighting the question of gender oppression and the idea of gender justice or increased gender justice, as I understood it. So that, is that parachuted in from the uh, communist, Leninist uh, ideologues? Maybe, but it's also generated by uh, collective actions themselves. So I can't give you, I'm not going to sit here and say this is the manifesto, this is the solution. But what I can say, and when I'm saying this, I'm saying it very much in, in relation to those pessimists who say, no, no, we need elite theory, is that the collective action itself is a generative force. It creates uh, new problems, new solutions emerge out of it. And that is where these uh, politics will emerge from if they're going to really take hold. Um, that's in response to those people who say the, the masses are just passive and they need to be shoved around. Um, it's not a satisfying answer. But I think it does the work in terms of my role as an academic in development studies, making the argument that collective actions themselves can be developmental. Um, yeah, uh, the anarchism, I, I, I take your point. I need to uh, do a lot more reading on that. I'm uh, moving in new directions, so I'll be, I'll be engaging a lot more in that. Maybe you can recommend some stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, more questions? Yes, at the back. questions you don't have to make a long contribution you can just ask a question yes other questions? Going once. <laughs> okay. Any last? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, great questions. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't purposely try and dodge that question. Obviously, I mean, there's a very good book by John Smith called Imperialism in, uh, in the 21st Century, 
uh, I'll recommend that. Um, yes, imperialism is a fact. It exists. How do you uh, oppose it? I mean, uh, that's difficult, but I mean, the ideas of uh, solidarity are really important. Um, yeah, I mean, understanding how the state is part of a kind of imperial structure is also, must be part of, it comes back to the idea of politics and consciousness and so on. I mean, this must be part of uh, successful movements, I guess. I mean, uh, this is a slightly paradoxical situation where you give a lecture and you talk about elites versus, you know, elite theory and so on, and then you say, well, these are the answers. Um, but, I mean, these are the questions that are raised time and again. Um, so, I see... So that, I, I, I've said lots of words, but I haven't actually answered your question. But I think one of the ways of thinking about it is, um, in terms of theory, is to understand, <clears throat> try and think about the world system as the capitalist system, not as a sphere of opportunity and a potential freedom, but as a co coercive, exploitative, uh, degrading structure. And that one is the reinforced by uh, imperial powers trying to reproduce their primacy. Uh, once you understand that, then you then these questions arise in terms of how far can we take our movements. Um, that has got to be part of the uh, that has that question has got to be on the table. You can't get away from it. What the answers are going to be, who knows? Uh, okay, um, collective bargaining versus community activism, and the question of flexibilization. It kind of fits together. Um, I mean, I read uh, Emmanuel Ness's book, uh, Southern Insurgency, recently, and um, it's quite good because, I mean, he gives a, one example of uh, big strikes in um, Indian auto production, where you've had this process of flexibilization of really over in uh, the Suzuki has taken over uh, one of the auto plants and shifted in a sh relatively short space of time from uh, a large percentage of permanently employed workers to um, overwhelming. I mean, over 90%, uh, I think, percentage of uh, flexible um, temporary workers. And what is inspiring about his account there is that the uh, strikes by permanent workers were on behalf of flexible workers demanding permanent contracts. Uh, so there is this potential that exists. I mean, that's, that is one small part of the answer. It's not the whole answer at all, but it's one aspect of that. Um, you know, we can think further about, um, you know, when, when we can think uh, in terms of a kind of world that we want, we can talk about um, spreading work and reducing the amount of work, which would uh, solve much of the unemployment and uh, over underemployment problem. Uh, you know, short working days, I mean, that should be a, in, in anyone's manifesto, a kind of increased leisure time. Uh, you know, leisure is the idea of being able to do what you want free of constraint. That's what Amartya Sen talks about. Um, it's absolutely uh, central. Um, in terms of role of theory, um, I think it's very important to, you know, we do our work. We think we have to engage with the different theorists and understand where we're coming from and why we're saying what we're saying. And also to create the space to try and learn as much as possible from those who have been excluded uh, and try and do, in a way, you know, what can we do? In ter I see my job in terms of furthering this is to try and uh, create theoretical space for the identification, illumination, uh, incorporation of uh, collective actions as generators of progressive uh, kind of thought and action. Um, you can't do everything, uh, obviously, but I think that's something that uh, I can do and I'm trying to do and I think that does contribute to development uh, thinking in some in some way or another. Uh, Gramsci, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, maybe counter-hegemonic blocks and the need to have alliances. Absolutely, I mean, if you think about labouring classes and the way labouring classes are fragmented and diverse in the sense that, uh, you know, where does labour stop and capital start? It's not just the Communist Manifesto of the world, ver Communist Manifesto vision of the world. We have these big capitalists with their massive factories and thousands of workers all looking the same and it's a clear class kind of dichotomy, not at all. 
um, you have all these fragmentations. And so in that sense, class analysis is very important. And also thinking strategically about class alliances uh, and class collaboration with different sections who may be in certain situations uh, opposing uh, the extension of capitalist f force field of um, extraction. So for example, indigenous uh, communities will have a differentiate class differentiation within them, but there may be a potential for uh, collaboration to stop certain projects and so on. And in that process of collaboration, new collective uh, endeavours may emerge which could take the movement further forward. So I think we have to have our eyes open for these rather than having a kind of uh, a purist conception that has this simplified version of the world um, which goes back to the caricature of Marx rather than himself. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks.